You're listening to the Study Legal English podcast, the world's first legal English podcast, helping lawyers and law students become fluent in legal English. Hello and welcome to the Study Legal English podcast. I'm your host Louise. I'm here in Warsaw at the Chopin Point Cafe and today I have a guest on the show to talk about improving your legal writing using plain language. Advocates of plain language follow certain principles, for example, using short sentences, omitting redundancies. So we'll be hearing some words of wisdom on this topic from today's special guest, who is Simon Porter. Simon, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you very much for inviting me. Brilliant. So Simon is a legal English language consultant. He's got many years of experience teaching English and legal English as well, courses with, for example, the British Council and in-house for a number of law firms. He is an advocate of plain English in legal writing and has developed a number of resources for learning about this topic, which you can find on his website, writtenlegalenglish.com. Com. And he's also got a very good YouTube channel where you can find videos about improving your legal writing. I highly recommend it. I've watched many of the videos and they're very informative, very clear and very useful. So today we're going to focus on just a few specific words which fall into the category of legalese and we'll look at these in great detail so that you can understand what they mean why they're dangerous and how to avoid them. The words are small but deadly and they're words which often pop up in legal writing. Simon, what kind of words are we talking about? Of course, we're talking about the commonly known legalese words which begin with here, there or where. And there are some others as well. To give you some examples, here to, whereby, here and after, there to for, mm-hmm. those are what's known as legalese. Yes, those terrible words. There's very many of them. I'm sure you listeners out there have heard of them and seen them in legal writing. So let's look at each one of these. Which one do you want to start with? I'm going to start with one of the ones that is most commonly met, and that is herein. This is one that causes lots and lots of problems because it seems so simple. If we were to translate this, define this, we would say in this document. But the question, of course, is what does it mean in this document? Uh, Mm. Does it mean in this particular provision? Does it mean in this particular chapter or section? Or does it mean in this contract as a whole? So as a word, it's pretty ambiguous. For example, maybe you might find in a contract, these parties agree herein to, and then so on. Would that be a good example, do you think? It depends on how clearly that particular clause of the contract is written. So if it's clear that it refers to a particular example or the contract as a whole, then that's not so much of a problem. Mm-hmm. But if we've got here in, here in, or it refers to a particular event, which the contract refers to only once, for example, then you've got that question, does this refer to just that particular moment or does it refer to the whole contract? And mm-hmm. therefore, does that then cause any problems? Maybe if they said the parties agree here, herein, you wouldn't be sure whether it was here in this document or here in this clause. And probably that's a redundant use of it anyway, because of course the parties agree in this document because they're they're making a contract and signing it. Well, the thing that perhaps is a little bit annoying from my point of view is that it's so easy to make that a lot clearer. We could refer to something and we could say in this clause or in this section or in this contract. Those alternative versions are simple, clear, concise. Everyone knows what's happening and there is no confusion as a result. So there is a simple, clear alternative people should use instead of herein. Okay, so instead of using herein, make sure you are very specific with what you're referring to. Instead, say, in this document or in this clause. Do you have any other comments about herein? Other than to say you'll hear it or see it in lots and lots of documents and that it's one of the easiest, really, to replace with a simple alternative. One that perhaps is a little bit rarer, but nevertheless is causes a lot of problems, is therefore. Mm. And that's not therefore with an E, uh, that's therefore without an E. And that means 
for that thing or for that purpose. And of course, many people think therefore, and they think that it's just a linker or conclusion linker. It doesn't mean that. It means something completely different. And of course, the problem is, is that therefore, the legalese therefore, is written without an E, but sometimes it's written with an E. Mm. Uh, There doesn't seem to be agreement as to how it's actually spelt. So you might see therefore with an E, and you might for no fault of your own, understand it as the other therefore that we know. Yes. It just causes problems everywhere you see it. Yeah, some people might think it's a typo. Indeed, yes, you're absolutely right. Because this word is quite rare, people they think it's a typo and then they just understand it the other way and therefore therefore you come up with a completely which, which different... Therefore. <laughs> which therefore? Which uh, therefore... <laughs> the concluding therefore uh, therefore you come up with uh, a completely different understanding to what the author intended so uh, it's one of my favourites and it's a very very difficult one to catch and Mm -hmm. indeed it catches lots of people out Do you have any recommendations for what listeners could do to avoid using this? It's it's quite rare in terms of meeting it Um, you would have to have someone... Uh, really, I would say, old school or taught by an old school lawyer who would use therefore. But generally, people are quite used to writing for a purpose, for this, for that, or something like that. Okay, so what's the next terrible word on our list? There is the whole discussion of uh, the differences between the here's and the there's. Um, And this is something that I do with lawyers. We do the boring exercise where we sit down with a a list of legalese words and I say, what do these mean? But then the question arises, uh, what's the difference between here to and there to Mm -hmm. or um, here for or therefore? Mm -hmm. And um, here refers to the document that you're talking about and there refers to another document. What that document might be may or may not be clear and that in itself leads to another problem. Mm, So in a similar way that... We use here and there in normal English, here being here something close to you and there being something further distant. You can sort of use that to remember that here is this document, there is something distant, something far away. Yep, that's a fantastic way to think about it. It might seem obvious. It might think, okay, here is this one and there is that one. But the problem I find is when... because I work here in Poland and have worked in Poland for a number of years, is that the translations of here and there sometimes don't take that into account. So you might have a translation of there to, and the lawyer would explain what that is, and I would say, well, what document are you talking about? And that question would throw the lawyer, because the translation doesn't take into account this document or that document. Mm. So sometimes it's a real light bulb moment for the lawyers that I work with. Sometimes these words are, are used and whilst the lawyers think that they are using legal terms and it makes their writing better, actually it does the complete opposite, which is it completely confuses the meaning and it's absolutely not precise at all. Funnily enough, as I was doing my homework uh, before (laughs) meeting you, I was looking at these legalese words and there was some discussion on the internet and someone actually said something which backs up exactly what you said. And someone said... This word has withstood legal scrutiny, which means that everyone in the world of law knows what this word means, and that's why we use it. And the complete opposite is true. Mm. These words are by nature ambiguous, and they could be interpreted in different ways. So you might hear that these are old-fashioned legal words, everyone uses them, so therefore we must use them. To a certain extent, yes, but bear in mind that modern drafting rules, modern way of thinking about legal language is that these words are inherently ambiguous. Yeah, my point of view would be that there are certain words which you can't replace, which are terms of art, which embody like a legal concept and which aren't at times absolutely necessary. Where you're dealing with words like here too, there too, the words that we're talking about, these legalese words, where there's an equivalent, a plain language equivalent, I would say use the plain language equivalent because you're not losing anything. These terms don't embody a legal concept. There's an alternative. And actually using the alternative can force you to make your writing clearer. But then there is that argument to say if a term of art can be expressed in English in a way that's not too long, then to use that alternative instead. Uh, 
And certainly, if you have a look at government documents, for example, or uh, documents issued by public authorities, you don't see any legal Latin terms because everyone knows that the reader more than likely won't know what these mean. Yes. So, yeah, yeah. if I get a document from the council and it says uh, mutandis mutandis or something uh-huh. like this, I, I don't know what that means, and nor would anyone else. Yes. Um, so, if there is a way to talk about it in an easier way, which doesn't take up too much time, not too many words, then use that instead. Yes, even those. Good. Okay. Are there any other of these terrible terms that we want to talk about? Well, yes. Uh, I mean, generally speaking, I'm against these legalese terms, and I think most of them can be removed from your writing fairly easily. Here and after is a perfect example. You really don't need to say that at all. But there is some discussion in the legal drafting community Mm -hmm. about some words. Hereby, for example, is a word which promotes discussion. There are some people who think, okay, we don't really need to say this. But there are some people that say, well, this word actually has got legal effect and we need to say hereby. And so there is a discussion right now as to should we use this, shouldn't we use this and... It's interesting to know that some legalese terms are being fought over and want to be kept. Mm. What's your point of view on hereby? I'm in part persuaded by the argument for keeping hereby. When more intelligent people than I, and there are many of them in this world, say, you know, (laughs) there's a reason why we might need this, then I'm prepared to Mm -hmm. listen to that argument and say, okay, if you need to keep that hereby, then I don't fight too hard with the herebys. Talking about hereby, I've recently been reading Ken Adams' A Manual of Style for Contract Drafting, Mm -hmm. and he suggests that hereby can be used in specific instances, for example... He distinguishes between different types of legal language, for example, language of performance, language of agreement. So with hereby, he says that this is language of performance and therefore you should use hereby only when you're writing what he would call a speech act. And I'll try to explain this. An example of of a speech act is where you, in a contract, you're actually doing something simply by writing a sentence and when the contract is executed that thing that you have written is done and an example of that would be the author hereby grants the license to the publisher so what that sentence is saying that's a performance sentence it's an act because by writing that and then signing the contract You've granted the license. You don't have to do something in the future. It's this intangible thing of the license. You simply have it by signing the contract. Um, nothing else needs to happen. Can I just throw a quick spanner into the, course, into the potential words there? And you did a fantastic job of explaining that, okay. by the way, much better than I could have done. <laughs> what if someone then uses that hereby as part of a conditional? So they would say, upon receiving monies or upon an act being performed, Mm -hmm. I hereby. So then it kind of includes an element of futurity. Mm -hmm. Uh, Would that cause a problem, a complication in, in hereby and understanding hereby? Yes, I would say in that situation, it's not necessary because... For example, if seller doesn't deliver the goods on time, buyer is hereby entitled to a refund That doesn't need a hereby. You could simply say buyer is entitled to a refund because it's reliant on a condition happening. It is not within that sentence that the buyer gets a refund. It's conditional on something else. And that's the that's the main problem I have with hereby uh, because in agreements in normal natural life, most things are predicated are based on conditionals. Uh, Mm. Most agreements are like, if you do this, I'll do this. Or Mm. if this happens, then this happens. And then you sign the agreement and then you wait for A to happen so B can continue. Mm. Then there'll be conditions which create agreements. So the occurrences of godlike statements where you empower people, I think, are very few and far between. I think this is where people might get confused because they might think, okay, 
to use that phrase of yours, what did you say? It was like a, a speech act. A speech act. And they think, well, speech act, what does that mean? Okay, um, am I doing a speech act? And then from that, because it's a complicated idea, you then start having misuse of hereby because mm. people start to misunderstand speech acts. And uh, I have a very, very simple rule of thumb, uh, which is, does a normal person or do I understand what's being written here? And if... The answer is no, then how can we say this again? How can yeah. we, what are we really trying to say here? I, I see the argument for hereby. Ken Adams is someone that I've read a lot of his material as well, mm-hmm. fantastic book. I'm prepared to be convinced, but I'm still a little bit undecided. Fair enough. Okay, moving on. What about the difference between hereby, for example, and whereby? Now, whereby is, I would consider that almost an exception to the legalese rule. In my experience, I see this kind of crossover from legal English into normal English. Because whereby means by which way or method. So, for example, they've set up a plan whereby you can spread the cost over a two-year period. So we've set up a plan So you can, or in this way, you can then spread the cost over a two-year period. Now, I've just given you two great examples instead of whereby, but whereby it might be said by normal people. You might go into a shop and someone might say, for your example, uh, this is something so whereby you can do this. And it seems a little bit more natural, a little bit more normal English to me. So I'm not... I'm not so so on the warpath with whereby. Yes, uh, yeah, I think I'd agree with you there. It's found much more in conversation, in normal English. If you were to replace it, what would you replace it with? There's a number of prepositions you could use. You could say by doing something or through or via so that you can is a phrase that we could use instead. There are alternatives to whereby, but sometimes the conciseness of one word, because it's largely understood, is perhaps better than stringing it out over four or five words. Good. Okay. Any other terms? Uh, Of legalese uh, that are bugbears of mine. Here and after, I don't like because, to be honest, it can just be deleted and everything means exactly the same and in that way there and after I would uh, I've come across there and after I was working on a due diligence trying to proofread it and in the appendix there were about 10 or 12 different documents all of them agreements and in the due diligence it said there and after there and after and I asked the lawyer there and after in which document and he didn't know and I was like well if you don't know why how do you expect the client to know so here and after there and after I, I absolutely hate the the two fours here to four there to four where to four I'm not a big fan of those either because you shouldn't be using those words anyhow hmm. I think you've covered the main ones and so to summarize for the listeners basically these words beginning with here there where just delete them. Consider what you are actually referring to. For example, um, Simon mentioned in a document he was proofreading, here and after or there and after kept coming up. And when he asked the lawyer, they couldn't refer to the document they were referring to. Whereas when you're writing your document, if you know you're referring to clause or section five, put in brackets section five, don't put in there and after. You're being more specific, you're making your writing much more readable and understandable for others and for yourself. Any other comments? Yeah, I mean, it's the the, my general one rule which appears over um, lots of the stuff that I talk about on my website. It's basically just asking yourself the sensible question, what am I trying to say? Very often I get a document and... um, The Polish lawyers in particular want to create a document that is lawyerly or seems scholarly in terms of law. And I would get that, proofread it, and I wouldn't have a clue what was being said. And I'd simply say to the lawyer and I'd say, what are you trying to say? And the lawyer would say, I'm I'm trying to say this. And I'd say, why didn't you just write that? And uh, it was kind of a light bulb moment. And it was... Your language can be simple but yet professional and loyally. Keep the idea in your head, what am I trying to say? And if you do that, you won't use any legalese and your clients or the judge will understand a lot better what it is that you're trying to communicate. Very good point. Well, hopefully that's given you listeners some 
tips as to how to improve your legal writing. So thank you, Simon, for coming on the show. Thank you very much for inviting me. As I mentioned at the beginning of the show, Simon has a great YouTube channel where you can find examples of hereby, therefore, etc., and how to improve your writing by avoiding these. So, Simon, what's the YouTube channel? If you type in written legal English, either as three words or as one word, as a chunk, uh, you'll see a rather a strange looking character in a red jumper uh, that would be me you'll see there that I do a number of units fantastic so written legal English for sure check out these videos brilliant I hope you enjoyed the show uh, thank you for listening and of course you can find out more about this episode at studylegalenglish.com if you liked it please share it with others And, of course, you can make comments on the show at studylegalenglish.com or send me an email at info at studylegalenglish.com. Thanks for listening and see you next time.